this is John Shadle. Thanks for tuning in and welcome to the Force Within You podcast. This is a show where I'm trying to find some goodness and positivity in my friends, squad mates, and in this case, detachment leaders, and bring that to you, the audience. I'm doing this because of experiences I've had with a Star Wars costuming community called the 501st Legion, where I've met a lot of different people from different walks of life and realized there's so much good in them. And we have an opportunity to share that in this show. Today I have with me Tasha Ruth. Tasha joined the 501st Legion in 2014. She's a member of the Dubak Ridge Garrison, the Jolly Roger Squadron, and 1st Imperial Stormtrooper Detachments, and the Imperial Officer Corps. She was the merchandise officer from 2015 to 2020 for the Dubak Ridge Garrison, the Black Widow Commander from 2016 to 2020, and is currently the Jolly Roger Squadron Detachment Leader. She also earned Baroness, which is 100 kills, in 2017. Welcome, and thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, this is awesome. So you're, you are the first person that I'm having the privilege of meeting right now. This is, this is the first time that I've interviewed somebody that I didn't know before the interview, and, and I'm really excited. We've, we've had, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes of conversation or something before doing this, and I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm really excited for uh, this interview. Glad to meet you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's nice to meet you as well. Thank you. So other than the things that I mentioned in the introduction... Tell us about you. Well, um, <laughs> there's so much about me. I I don't know. There's there's. I think if you were to ask someone else, uh, they would call me hot dog queen. I love <laughs> hot dogs, not necessarily just to consume, but the idea of hot dogs. I have, you know, I'm actually wearing a hot dog necklace right now. Sure. That my friend Jessica made me. Um, you know, I have just looking around my room, hot dog art, hot dog magnets on my fridge. I just I love hot dogs. Um that's something about me. I love, love, love wearing very outrageous things. So if you see me at a Star Wars celebration and I'm wearing like completely holographic clothing or wearing a hot dog costume, like, don't be surprised. Uh, I, I, I love that. And, you know, just like, I, I think that um, it's hard to encompass me in, in a, a couple of sentences. Okay. I so I got a couple questions just from yeah. that already. What is it about the idea of hot dogs that you like? It's a lifestyle. It's <laughs> like, it's not just a food. It's a lifestyle. Like, like I don't know what that means. So my best friend Juanita is a photographer and I've thought of this concept of like having me in my hot dog costume, like leg draped over a throne with just like the throne is made out of hot dogs, like in Game of Thrones, but it's not swords. It's just hot dogs and just, you know, with a tilted crown also made out of hot dogs, of course, just, I don't know. I can't explain it. You know, Hot Dog Princess? No. And Adventure Time? Uh-uh. <laughs> well, if you haven't seen Adventure Time, you need to see that. Oh, hot Dog gosh. Princess is my girl. So so I'm I'm imagining a sexy hot dog just kind of draped over the hot dog throne. Is that what you're talking about? It's somewhere between sexy and, like, <clears throat> manly. <laughs> okay. Not necessarily feminine sexy, just over the top. <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> Just hot dog sexy. And I really want to do this photo. And I know Juanita would do it. I just, she's good at, she's good at like, you know, editing photos afterwards. I'm sure she could edit hot dogs in there, but I'm, I'm kind of like, well, we can't use real hot dogs. Cause then what do we do with them afterwards? Like we'd have to eat them. And I, I would maybe beat my own record of hot dogs. Consumed, What's your record? So. <laughs> so <clears throat> i've been in a couple hot dog eating contests okay um there was <laughs> there's a local hot dog joint here in albuquerque and they actually sponsored me 
Um, they sponsored me to be in um, in a hot dog eating contest, and I, I won third place in that one. And I feel pretty good about that though, because I was going up against all military dudes. Mm. So those dudes can scarf down food. So this was more of like a speed contest. And okay. so um, I did pretty okay. But Alice Cooper had this restaurant in Phoenix called Cooper's Cooperstown. And I was out for Phoenix Comic Con one year and my friends um, in the Dune Sea Garrison we're like, hey, let's we're we're taking you out to dinner afterwards. And I said, oh, where? And you know, it's a surprise, of course. And so, <laughs> I get there, and they're like, Cooperstown is famous for this two foot long hot dog on like a full size baguette, and you're gonna eat it. Oh. And I was sitting there thinking, oh, like, I've just eaten lunch earlier today. Like, I I feel like I should have starved myself to prepare for this, <laughs> and I just didn't. And somehow I did it. I ate the whole thing and I was like, that turned in, that turned into a story. So I went to Ikea the next day and, you know, Ikea has those meatballs and I got a plate of 15 and I was like, man, I'm I'm still hungry. Probably just because my stomach was so stretched out from eating like a two foot hot dog. So I ate a second plate and then, you know, and then I just continued, you know, I drove back to Albuquerque and then kind of continued the rest of the week. And I think three days later, I was like, oh my God, I have not pooped <laughs> since the hot dog. And, and I actually ended up in the hospital because what? I, <laughs> yeah, I backed up my system and I, yeah, I had to, had to get like a, a medical enema basically. And and then, and then the very next, that was on a Friday. And then that Saturday is when the hot dog joint sponsored me to be in the oh, hot dog eating no. contest. So I cleared, I cleared oh. one unit out and, you know, went to the next one. But they so I actually again. ended up going back the following year oh to complete the challenge again. And I live streamed it and I wore my hot dog costume that time. And Alice Cooper himself ended up posting about me on his Instagram because here I was completing the challenge and I I felt like a cannibal though like dressed as a hot dog (laughs) eating a hot dog so but you know it was it was pretty cool and it kind of gave me some real solid affirmation about my my title as hot dog queen so oh my gosh that's yeah. so funny. The, and, and that totally took the second thing that you said completely out of my mind. I, I had another question, but I forgot what that was. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, uh, <laughs> it's a real thing. I thought these were jokes on no. on, <laughs> on the JRS page. They're real. They're oh real. Oh, my God. It's a real lifestyle. It's a hot dog lifestyle. Well, and I say that because, so I stopped eating meat. Um, two, two years ago, three years ago, I guess. And every once in a while, I'll still sneak like an actual all beef hot dog. Cause like, you don't go with the turkey ones, the, the pork and turkey and chicken. Those are nasty. You go with all beef, kosher beef. Um, shout out to Hebrew national. Okay. That's the best, that, those are the best hot dogs in my opinion. But, uh, so, you know, with, with like meat alternatives, these days things are better than they used to be i think that if i had tried to stop eating meat 10 years ago i would have been like absolutely not this is this tastes like cardboard yeah which some of them still do but like the the vegan hot dogs are really good and so like people are like oh you can't you're not eating hot dogs and i'm like no i'm eating hot dog hot dog doesn't say that has to be beef like if you're eating chicken pork and turkey hot dogs then that's the same thing as a tofu one because it's not all beef but yeah it's just you know it's a it's a lifestyle and i love them i love the way they they have you can just dress them up with whatever toppings you want okay but talk about that because you're kind of a topping snob oh yeah yeah i love well, first of all, you can't put ketchup on a hot dog. Mm. You can't. 
if you're an adult, if you're a child, you can put ketchup on a hot dog, but not as an adult. And so, yeah, no, the toppings, there was, there was a hot dog recipe contest, which I won. And I was so proud of myself. I want to, I want a gift card to Urban Hot Dog Company, my favorite hot dog joint here. And um, and so it's still on their menu and I guess people still get it. It's called the Havana is what it's called. And it's um, I came up with a recipe like huh. know, five years ago, maybe. And it's uh, like a split sausage with Black Forest ham, um, some raspberry jam. Whoa. spicy mustard and a pickle okay and it's really good nice yeah oh my gosh i'm making you hungry <laughs> <laughs> yeah and <clears throat> i had no idea that this was so real mm-hmm. this is so funny i love it yeah when i say it's a lifestyle i i mean it's a lifestyle Man. i live i live i live for it so so do you have any other interests outside of hot dogs? <laughs> no, none at all. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, like I, uh, I like Star Wars a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. Um, I so actually, I something I'm really, really big on, and you know, you did that podcast with Marcy recently. So Marcy is like a kindred spirit. Her and I love salacious crumb, and we also have another very specific common interests so like slash has come is pretty p- specific but like marcy and i love moogles which are these cute little creatures from final fantasy okay if you've ever played the final fantasy games um not. moogles have been around since the 90s and so there are these cute little creatures and they say koopo that's what they say and I'm just looking all around me and you can find one in every corner. They're just, they're all over the place. I love okay. them. They're so cute. Um, but it's hard to find them, you know, because it's like, they're, they're not even like a main character in the game. They're just like kind of one of the cute recurring creatures. So, you know, I, anytime I can find anything, I, you know, I grab it as soon as I can. So, okay. but you know, like, uh, I think one of the, uh, like an actual, like hobby of mine is traveling. Like I'm really, really big on traveling. That has been a big part of my life. Okay. Traveling um, all over the place. Like where? Give me some examples. So I used to live in Japan. Um, When I was 19, I was like, I'm going to go to Japan. And I went on a, you know, a six month visa. And then I was like, I'm going to stay in Japan. And I ended up staying for like four years. And so my mom was so mad at me, of course, but uh, she's like, when are you coming home? I was like, I don't know. This is awesome. So I actually stayed in Japan for four years. Um, That was kind of a shocker for me when I moved back to New Mexico. People talk about culture shock. And so I didn't actually learn this term until years later. It's actually on the United States um government website there's a whole subsection about it about reverse culture shock and that was something that that i experienced um i you know i was suffering from depression for years and i i could not figure out how to fix it and then i took a trip to star wars celebration in 2012 that was actually so I moved back here in 2008 and I had not traveled anywhere after moving back from Japan from 2008 to 2012 and then I went to Star Wars Celebration in Orlando and it was actually um I didn't even really know that conventions were a thing at the time like I had always really been into video games and like comics and stuff like that just apparently nobody ever told me that there were conventions I just didn't know and I you know, I'm never aware of my surroundings. So I'm sure if there were like ads for it, I would have never seen them. So I just remember being absolutely mind blown going there. And when I came back, I was like on this high and, you know, and then eventually kind of my depression started to seep in again. And then I went 
to Disneyland, which I hadn't been to since I was a kid, um, <clears throat> I think the following spring with some friends. And again, same thing. It was like that same high. And then like, eventually I realized when I go on these like trips, even if it's just traveling to, you know, somewhere for the weekend or whatever, like there is something, I guess cathartic is, is the word I'm going to use for this about it. And when I come back home, you know, I can kind of ride, ride that wave of depression and, you know, just kind of skim over the top of it. And then like when I stop traveling is kind of when I start experiencing that depression again, I think just because I'm such a, I wouldn't say active in the sense that I, I, you know, I go hiking and stuff like that, but I, I, I like to be out and feeling stuck at home all the time has had kind of put me in that rut. And so when I started traveling, I, you know, could always look forward to the next trip and plan and save for the next trip. So every time I was working, it was like, you know, oh, just working the mundane every life. It instead became, I'm working and I'm saving for these awesome trips. And I would go on these awesome trips with my best friends. And um, we've been to Scotland, England, Wales, um, Netherlands, Germany, France, Switzerland, um, Luxembourg, Austria, Czech, um, gosh, where else did we go? We went to Denmark. I'm forgetting two places here, Italy. And then did I say Germany already? If yes. not, that was one of them. Yeah. We did this big road trip and it was awesome. That's cool. How, how often would you go? So I go to Japan actually usually every year and a half. My, oh, wow. um, my son, uh, he's half Japanese and his dad actually, um, he saves up to fly us out there every year and a half. So, um, we do that every year and a half, but the, the other trips we were averaging around every two years, okay. but I don't buy stuff, you know, like I know that's, that's the one thing, like, uh, I had so many star Wars collectibles that I was constantly buying, 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 buying. And then I realized like how much money I was really spending on that stuff. And at the end of the day, they were just things that sat on my shelf and they, they didn't bring me the same sense of joy that traveling did. And so I kind of really stopped buying all those really expensive collectibles and started saving up for travel. And, and it's been awesome. It's definitely, I would say one of my biggest hobbies for sure. That's cool. So with, with the every year and a half and the every two years, you're, you're, you're almost going once a year somewhere, whether it's Japan or somewhere, some, one of the other destinations that you, that you mentioned. At least. Yeah. We were actually supposed to go to Japan at the end of March oh. and that got canceled. Yeah. Um, and, and it's almost a blessing in disguise though, because the Nintendo Land, which is a section of Universal Studios in Japan. I mean, it is crazy. You, you got to look at the pictures and the videos of it. It's just completely like Super Mario World themed. And it is so like immersive. And it was supposed to be done by April of this year. Didn't get completed on time and is getting completed, I think, by March of next year. So now that we're shifting our plan over, we get to go to that. And so like my best oh, friend Juanita cool. is a huge, huge Nintendo nerd. So it's going to be awesome for her to be able to, to get to experience that on that same trip. Yeah. My brother too. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to tag him on this interview. It looks awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Okay. So why did you go to Japan in the first place? So, when I was a senior in high school, there was a foreign exchange student, um, <laughs> and I had a big crush on him. We ended up, so he was actually at our school for two years, and so he was a junior and I was a senior, and we started dating, and then I graduated, and then he finished his junior year, or his senior year the next year, and he's like, well, you know, I, I, I gotta go back home to Japan now because I can't you know, I'm not a citizen here. I'm just an exchange student. And 
So he's like, yeah, my, you know, my mom said she'd buy you a flight out there. And um, so I actually went out there with him. Um, that was a really tough situation. It was, uh, this is something that I, I, I do feel comfortable talking about now that I'm out of the situation. Um, and I also feel like, you know, it helps kind of um, advocate for people who have ever, or who might currently be in this situation. But when I moved to Japan with this guy, he, he was pretty normal when we lived here in the United States. And then when we got there, he became very controlling and like abusive, like physically, mentally, you name it. He was really abusive and, um, ended up isolating me from my family. Um, and you know, back in the early two thousands, I couldn't um, text, you know, I couldn't use like, like my space or, or like, or Facebook to like text, like we, like we can now. And so, um, I was kind of stuck there at first, to be honest, I did, you know, I did stay out there on, on my own free will, but it was after I left. So I, um, it was this crazy situation where a coworker of mine, I told him what was going on and he was like, have as much of the stuff that you want to own ready tomorrow morning and I'm going to pick you up. And, um, you know, he told our boss, like, we're both taking tomorrow off of work. And I, the guy that I was with went to work early and I, you know, I think I pretended I was sick or something that day to stay home. And while he was at work, I essentially ran away. It was like this really scary situation. And, um, but I, you know, like I, got out and I never ever saw him again. And, um, I, you know, my friend put me up in his house with him and his wife, uh, for a couple of months. And it was this weird, really weird time for me where I was like, do I go home? Do I stay here? And it was probably pretty crazy of me to stay. Cause I ended up staying like another two two to three years after that. I had always wanted to go to Japan and I felt like my experience was ruined by this situation that I was living in. So I kind of really wanted to have a new chance at having oh wow that experience of Japan. And so, um, you know, I just, from that point on, I just went crazy. I was like, I, you know, I was making money and I wasn't spending any money on rent. And so I was just like, going out, doing all the coolest things you could possibly do, like, you know, going to like, you know, restaurants that are serving like Kobe beef, like for like $200 a plate or like uh, going to, you know, Tokyo Disneyland and just uh, all these different theme parks and things and like these experiences um, that I had the money to spend on because it was just all expendable money and I was making like $3,000 a month. And it was just all expendable. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of like what kept me there was that I really didn't want my experience and my image of Japan to be tainted by this this experience that I had where I was kind of trapped, you know. And so that was uh, – some some people do know that about me. I do – you know, I do talk about these things a lot, but um, some people don't. So, well, and- yeah, that's uh, – you know, that's kind of the reason that I that I went and stayed there. Okay. Yeah. And while you were, while you were talking about that, I went and looked up, uh, the national domestic violence hotline, which is 800-799-7233. If you're in a situation like that, please call and get help. Yes. So thank you for sharing that story. That's, yeah, that's very cool that you, that you're comfortable sharing that having lived through such a terrible situation and seeing that you got to the other side of that. So thank you. I did. And I, you know, I feeling so safe now I can, I can talk about that. And that's something that I like to advocate to people. Like, you know, it does, it does get better because I remember feeling, feeling trapped, like, Oh, I'm never going to get in a better situation than this. And that's absolutely not true. And so, um, yeah. And so what was that? It's good to voice those things. Yeah. And what, what was that? That was the first, how much, how long of your four years in Japan? Like a year and a half. Okay. Yeah. Wow. 
that's and and that's that's so courageous of you to stay to to fix that experience sort of uh, for the for the next two and a half years to make that a I mean not that you did that on purpose but I mean maybe you did but it's that's so courageous of you to stick around for another two and a half years when you could have easily come back home and and run away from it. Yeah. Yeah. And I definitely felt safe when I had, you know, kind of gotten out of the situation. I moved to, I literally moved to the heart of Tokyo. I was right smack dab in the middle of Tokyo and which was, you know, like an hour and a half away from where I had been living. And, um, you know, I was making new friends. I, um, Tokyo is such a big city, you know, like sure. I was safe. I felt safe. I, you know, I lived in a, I lived in like a shared community. That was a really cool experience. What does that where, mean? Uh, you rent a bedroom out basically. And then you all share the rest of the house together. Okay. Um, so it, you know, much like roommates, but this is a bit different because it was in an apartment building and each floor was like a community. So like I, I was on, I think the fourth or fifth floor, I can't even remember now, but you know, I had my room that was in the corner and it kind of had like some of its own things. Like it had its own mini fridge and some things. And then there was like a community and that was tough. Cause like <laughs> we had like the shared shower. And I remember walking out in the morning, getting ready to go to work and watching just all these silly goobers like lined up to take a shower. And I'm like, why don't you guys take a shower at night? Like me, like you don't have to worry about this in the morning. There's like literally like seven of them just lined up waiting oh, to wow. take a shower. And it was just so funny. Um, but you know, like I was surrounded, um, by other foreigners and a lot of them kind of knew my situation. So they knew to kind of keep an eye out for me. And there was this, you know, camaraderie there. And it was, um, I always felt safe. And even my, um, my Irish friend, Paul, actually, um, he would, um go with me places and this dude was like six foot four so like i'm like i've got paul with me i'm totally safe you know and nice. so yeah i was i don't know courageous so much but just like i just really wanted to fix my experience that's and courage I had, oh i had yearned to go to japan for so long i was you know one of the anime nerds and i wanted it for so long and to have it like just totally utterly destroyed like that was really difficult for me. And so it was kind of my way of fixing it, you know? Well, yeah. And, and that's, you know, no matter how you want to look at it, you take a, a nasty situation like that and you do what you did. I call that courage. So call it what you want. I don't, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, sure. But that takes courage to take control. So for, for everybody out there who can see it potentially the way that you do, everybody needs to know that that's courage that, you know, it, it takes a, it takes a gutsy person to be able to, to get to the other side of a, an abusive situation and make yeah. something good out of it. That's courage. So don't, <laughs> don't, don't hear any other words. That's all, right. all that is. <laughs> and you stop it. Okay. All right. Stop. Cool. So, okay. So I, just for curiosity's sake, is it is it really like the mecca of technology in Japan? Oh yeah. Like what oh, kind yeah, of cool definitely. things did you see that no, we don't? No, I just well, I remember the the day that I arrived we were picked up by family in a van who had, you know, driven to the airport and Narita Airport is kind of far from Tokyo it, driving it's about an hour and a half or so it's kind of far but I remember stepping out of the airport and just getting this fresh breath of like green you know because I if coming from New Mexico the desert mm -hmm. I don't know how to explain it I was just like there was so much green all around me and I feel like I could feel it in my lungs like it was just so fresh and I you know, I can still, when I think about it, I, like, I still experience that sensation. It gives me chills. Um, 
So like my first experience of Japan, literally walking out of the doors of the airport was like, wow, it's so green here. And that still rings true to this day. There's just so much green and, and I love it. See, I remember that was the first time I actually ever used a bidet was when I lived in Japan. And I was like, what is this thing? And, you know, of course freaked me out the first time, but like <laughs> everyone has a bidet and even just going to the public restrooms, there's a bidet on every toilet and they also have, <laughs> this is great. So if someone's self-conscious about using the restroom, they have a button on the little panel of the toilet that plays a flushing sound. So it just plays it until you turn it off. And so like just these awesome t like minor conveniences that really add up to the big picture. And like, I remember, um, you know, going to a restaurant and in the United States, you know, you're like sitting waiting for your waitress to notice you. Sometimes you might like kind of put your, put your hand up to see if she sees you and you're just waiting and waiting. And in Japan at every table, they have this little, um, I call it the ping pong because that's the sound that it makes ping pong. Um, it's a little bell, a button that you push. And as soon as you push it, the, you know, your, your staff is notified to come to your table and they're there in like three seconds. And it was the coolest thing to me. And I don't like, it's such a, like a small detail that could easily, easily be implemented here in the United States, but like, mm -hmm. you'd have to totally change the mindset of the entire country to do it, you know, like yeah. get people used to that or whatever. I know that like some of the chain restaurants, I think like Applebee's have like those iPads and stuff at the table. And I think you can do something like that oh. there, but, um, I've only been to Applebee's like once in the last like 10 years. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, just like going to the arcades, that was something. I walked in and it was just like, what is this? This is so cool. And so this was back in like 2006. And if you've ever heard of the, an the anime Gundam Wing, or Gundam, they're these giant mecha robots because Japan, right? Right. So there's these giant mech robots that fight. And so anyway, you know, I, I've always kind of been into those and they have little plastic models you can build and stuff. And I had, before I even had gone to Japan, I had built maybe like 30 of them. I was like totally into it. And I walked into this arcade and I see all these like, anime and like video game just stuff that I've been obsessed with for years but like in the United States you can't just walk into anywhere and see it you know like obscure what we would consider obscure but not so obscure over there you know and so I walked into this arcade and I see these pods and they're much like the battle pods the Star Wars battle pods if you've ever seen those at arcades here no but they were Gundam. And I was like, this is crazy. So what do you do? And you're literally fighting other people in other pods. And so they have like eight of them lined up and you're just on this massive battlefield and you're literally controlling like this giant mech suit. And it was just the coolest thing to me. And like some of the things, you know, I've seen like game centers and arcades here that are really catching up to that now, but I'm like, oh yeah, that was like, back in 2006 you know and so just there's just like these minor things that really constantly pile up and then like the overall picture is just you know advanced technology and that's and, cool. and I remember even just walking into an electronic store and being like there are 42 different options of hair dryers to use like what do they do? And just, <laughs> it was just the coolest thing. And it was, you know, like when people asked me if I had the culture shock, absolutely not. I was just totally mesmerized by how it, it's otherworldly. There's like no other way to explain Japan. Japan is otherworldly, you know, like going to all those European countries that I've been to, like there are lots of beautiful places and I like to try other food and, uh, but it just, it still feels Westernized and I had been to Taiwan and I've been to Korea and they still 
somehow feel like they're part of this world. Japan just feels like it's on another planet, and huh. I love that. Yeah, I've always wanted to go and stay in one of the... Um, I, I don't know what you call it, but the hotels where you just basically have a cubicle that you just like capsule. launch your a capsule. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where you just launch yourself into. I've I've always wanted to go because of that kind of thing. And I mean, just to see all the technology and uh, go to, I, I don't remember what the intersection is, but the biggest intersection. Um, Shibuya. What is it? Shibuya. Oh, okay. Yeah, go there and just see see that. I mean, and now that there's a Nintendo Land or whatever, mm -hmm. um, go there. I, I'd actually like to go there with my brother and and watch him geek super hard. So you should. Yeah, I, should. it's it's super, it's super convenient. I just remember like, oh, what am I gonna do now that I'm like leaving this situation? I have to be completely reliant on other people and then i moved to tokyo and i was like oh i can take a train anywhere and they're fast it's every two minutes they're coming you know and i remember oh wow i remember there was this national apology on like national television because one of the trains left like 30 seconds early and you know people are literally diving into the doors as they're closing as the trains are going because that's the time that they go to work every day and so if the train leaves 30 seconds early, the next train isn't for another two minutes. And now they're two minutes late to work or whatever, you know, cause they have it like just impeccably timed out. And so like the, the public transportation is such a convenience there too. So like it's super travel friendly. Wow. Yeah. You should definitely go. Cool. All right. So anything else about you we need to know? <laughs> I think I'm, told you everything at this point <laughs> yes i mean from from the the hot dog lifestyle to being backed up and then the jap the japanese stuff that's cool do, yeah. so do you speak japanese uh i think i speak more than i give myself credit for when okay. i'm in japan i don't seem to have too much difficulty communicating with others okay but i also feel like i don't speak it very well okay Gotcha. So, I think I'm just being hard on myself. Yeah, seems like you do that. Yeah. I mean, you know, having known you for a little over an hour. <laughs> All right, so off to the the first part, I guess the second part of the show, now that we've done a, what, 40-minute intro? <laughs> so getting, getting on to Star Wars-y things, um, how, I mean, you, you kind of, you briefly mentioned you go into the, to the comic convention. Um, but how, how did you get into just star Wars? I mean, what, <laughs> caught, what, what got your attention? This is a funny story and my parents love when I tell it. So I want to say I was, so I'm 34, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a young man. I was 10 when the remasters came out. Okay. In the 90s. And 96, right, was when they first remastered A New Hope, I think, when it, when they relaunched it in theaters. So uh, <laughs> I was the most Disney child you can possibly imagine, just watching Little Mermaid seven days a week, watching Beauty and the Beast, watching all the Disney princess movies I possibly could. So one day, my dad said all right get in the car we're gonna go see a movie and i'm just excited because you know growing up we didn't go to the theater a lot so i was like oh what are we gonna go see and i was just excited thinking it was gonna be a disney princess movie and <laughs> i don't remember if they showed me i mean like you know obviously back then they couldn't pull up a picture on the internet but like they showed me something and I just absolutely lost it. Just had a total, and I didn't really have tantrums as kids. I didn't have meltdowns, but I had an absolute meltdown that day. I remember sitting behind my dad in the van and just kicking his seat and screaming and crying. I absolutely did not want to see this most ridiculous mo looking movie. I was like, this looks so stupid. I don't want to see this like where are all the princesses and 
I walked out of that movie and it changed my life forever. Just, I looked at my dad and he said, Ooh, there's another one. When is it coming out? You know? And just like from that point forward, it was like, for Halloween, I wanted to be Princess Leia that year. And like, just, you know, constantly. And so it's funny that it comes full, full circle that she's actually a Disney princess now, right? Yeah. Um, but wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. My parents forced me to go. And so, you know, I tell my dad, you know, you guys made me into this monster because this is entirely like without a doubt your fault. And so I was really, really, really into it. Just kind of, I think that was kind of my flip where I kind of became a tomboy and, you know, just constantly wearing Star Wars shirts all the time. And of course, you know, back in the nineties, there were only boys shirts for, for Star Wars. And so, you know, I was wearing Chewbacca, I was wearing Darth Vader and like, I had all this cool stuff. And there was definitely a lot of the experience back when I was a little girl where boys were like, you can't like Star Wars, you're a girl. Mm -hmm. And, you know, cause I want to say I was in first, maybe second or third grade when, when that happened. I, I can't even think. Um, but you know, it's, so I kind of, really got into anime as a middle schooler and kind of forgot about Star Wars. Like I had always still liked it, but it just wasn't in my life that much anymore. And then when I moved back from Japan, actually there was something that I, that I went to where I saw a Star Wars poster and I asked my son's dad, like, Hey, have you ever seen this movie? He's like, oh yeah, I don't really like it. It's really cheesy. And I was like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? And like somehow that like like started a fire up in me again where I just started really getting really back into Star Wars. And then it's kind of been that way ever since. And, and then a few days later, you left Japan and came back because you're like, no, nobody gets to say that right. this is cheesy. <laughs> we were actually back in the United States actually at this point. So, um, Oh, you yeah. said it's time for you to go. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. All right. You, you find Star Wars or your dad forces you into Star Wars. And, right. <laughs> and how, how do you. That's terrible. <laughs> yeah. And how did you end up getting into maybe costuming in general, but, but then leading into 501st? Sure. So I think my very, <laughs> I guess technically my very first costume that was like handmade that was made because they couldn't find a costume was princess leia in fourth grade and there's actually a picture of me um just i think we use like doll hair to make the little buns and we cut up a cleopatra costume to make to make the dress and so okay. technically if if we want to get technical that was the first costume and then in middle school. So my grandmother was a seamstress and I was really into Sailor Moon and I was like, grandma, ba Baba is what we call her. She was, she's my Russian grandmother. I was like, Baba, you have to make me this Sailor Moon costume. I don't think anyone's ever done it before, you know, just because in my mind, cosplay didn't exist. It wasn't like a thing that I knew about. And so I, <laughs> I remember she helped me make this Sailor Moon costume and it looks so good. And I still have pictures of me in it. And, you know, I, try to wear it to school one day of course and got in trouble because you know it's sailor moon those those skirts are really short but um then going to star wars celebration in 2012 was really when i was like what people wear this like you can buy this and so i was like trying to find out information and of course i think kind of more towards the start of my journey it was still kind of hush hush like secret like you you got to research and work hard to buy it. And now we're just like, yeah, come join, you know? Yeah. And so um, I went to the Blu-ray release of the saga. And that was over here at our local Hastings. And that is when I met the local 501st. And it was he's now a friend of mine his name is jake he lifted he was a scout trooper he lifted you know the face plate up yep. and winked at me and then put it back down and you know because he's just trying to be cool because that's so jake and i was like oh my god that's like 
just a regular dude. Like, how, you know, I started talking to them and, you know, they kept saying, when are you going to join? When are you going to join? And then finally I, you know, Mon Cal was out at our local convention and I was like, I'm doing it. I'm just buying it. And I bought, I originally wanted a scout actually. And, you know, he's like, oh, that's like an eight month wait. And I was like, no, I want to join now. So I ended up with a Thai pilot having no idea the detachment that I was about to get into, which is, you know, of course the best one. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, like it's just kind of these little instances in my life where I kind of realized that cosplay was a thing and costuming. And so. Okay. And what, what year did you come across them? I mean, how long did it take you from finding out about the 501st to actually joining? So 2012 it would have been when I found out about them really. Um, so I guess, yeah, it took me like two years. Okay. That's cool. And, and so since you joined, has there been something that has there been a troop or an experience or something that's that, that has really, that really stands out in your mind? There are so many of these. It's so hard. I, that one that Marcy was talking about in the podcast, that is one. And of course, you know, I don't, I don't have to repeat that whole story. It's been told, but um, you know, the kitten's house, but there was, there was another one where actually, and this is kind of really when I started becoming closer friends with Adam Peterson, the, the former detachment leader for Jolly Roger squadron, where there was a little boy in a wheelchair um, in California who, <laughs> I guess he had gone to a comic convention there and he had dressed up his wheelchair to look like an exploded TIE fighter. And oh, cool. uh, Matthew is his name. And a bunch of us kind of all worked together to get him his very own accurate TIE pilot costume. Nice. And so I didn't get to be part of the delivery on that, but just being part of that whole process was towards the beginning of being in the 501st Legion. And that's really kind of what opened my eyes to the idea of what the 501st Legion really does constantly. And since then I've been involved as much as I can with so many projects. And it's like, so I've even just recently been on the receiving end of this, but the 501st Legion are just constantly looking out for each other. And so a lot of the time people, when they're thinking about the 501st Legion, they think about what we do for the outside world, but what I've seen the membership do for the internal organization is absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. Just fundraisers for each other, just, lifting each other up there's just in that type of camaraderie is i think almost even bigger for me in a sense because I, I i see that it's not all just about what we can display to the world but we're also doing it internally where others aren't seeing it and so there's like you know this integrity there that i'm seeing and that's huge too oh that's cool i've i've, I've not I've not ever thought about that, but yeah, I've, I've had the opportunity to, you know, donate to some people and help some people out in, in different ways. But I, you know, I just think of that as, you know, you just, you take care of your own kind of, I mean, maybe that sounds a little cheesy, but, but that's, that's how it feels. You just kind of take care of your own and, and that's, you know, it just feels like that's just, how it should be not like it's anything special but yeah that's yeah. that's a really good point i i i'm kind of I, I get to look at that in a, a bit of a different light now and i'm kind of proud of that 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 so many of us are like that that we have that mentality that's really cool yeah, yeah. thanks for pointing that out so a, a question that kind of occurred to me just now um a, aside from well, maybe not aside from anything. A question that occurred to me just now to ask, and, and maybe you've already sort of answered it, but what does it mean to you to be a part of the 500 first? Sorry, I have to think on this one. I want, I, okay. I want to make sure it's thoughtful. 
Um, the 501st for me has evolved over the years. When I first joined, it was just this overwhelming sense of coolness. There's really no other word to apply yeah. to it. It was just so cool. I was like, posting pictures in my costume all the time like guys check me out i'm literally star wars <laughs> this is my dream to be this and you know it's just like i think a lot of people when they first join are like this too where they are really just excited and hyped up and then you know you get this lull where you're not as active or you're just tired or what have you. And of course, this year has been very, very different for troopers. And so I think that everyone's kind of in a lull, but like, I really can't wait to get back to trooping because I just, I love, I love seeing other members. There is definitely like the charity aspect of the group that I really enjoy. Um, but there is this sense of the, the camaraderie that I was telling you about a lot of members of the 501st Legion, um, are somewhat alone in their lives. Mm -hmm. They may not have any friends locally. I I've heard this from so many members that, you know, they live in a country where Star Wars isn't really looked at as this cool thing. And so people think they're kind of weird and their friendships form in this group and people are able to not, to, to not feel so alone in the world. And that's pretty important to me that sure we're doing this charity work, but a lot of charity work is done all over the world by all sorts of people and uh, not to discount the work that we do, but I, I definitely think just like, like I said, the internal aspect of it, we are like a family and we're friends. And the fact that people can come into this club and be, you know, isolated in another country where people think they're weird because they're into star Wars and suddenly be opened up to this world where, everybody loves them and they're cool and their collection is awesome. I think is really special. That's cool. That's a great answer. Thank you for that. That's yeah. I, I mean, you know, being one of those where I, I mean, I had my friends, but I didn't have, a, a, I mean, not nearly as many as I do now, but I didn't feel such a strong connection with, with as many people, as I do now, I, I feel like I'm part of, um, a much bigger thing than me now. And, and, you know, having maybe several friends, a few friends that, that I would consider really close. Uh, I, I, I mean, I've expanded that to now, you know, I can have a conversation with you and feel very connected to you from just from the first words that we say and no nervousness, no, no shyness, nothing like that. It's just like, I kind of already know you because I know the person that joins the 501st. Right now that's, you know, that's oversimplifying it for sure. <laughs> but, but I, I kind of have that feeling and, you know, we, we've met people from out of the country and, uh, definitely from different states, but with everybody, it's the same. Hey, how's it going, brother or sister yeah. or you know, pal, whatever. It, it's it's a it's a real it's a real good feeling to know that you have something in common with somebody else. And and I don't know why, but it's so cool. It's just it's it is. yeah. It's I mean, take Star Wars out of it. And it's still super cool. Put Star Wars in, and now it's just, I mean, it's its world changing for me. Yeah. So it's its just is really great. All right. Do you have anything else that you want to talk about? I don't. Okay. So I feel like we've gotten to the last question, and that is, what is the force within you? That has kind of evolved over the years. I think it's kind of always 
been on the same track, but now it's a slightly different train. Um, I've always wanted people to not feel so alone. This is something that I've lived by since I was young. Um, you know, I don't want someone sitting alone at the lunch table in school or, or whatnot. And one of the things that I think we can kind of tie into Star Wars, um, since it's force related is that, um, the rebellion, I know I'm saying this is an Imperial, <laughs> the rebellion have this kind of sense of hopelessness, you know, this hopelessness and they, they feel so small and insignificant compared to the to the force of the empire. And I am recently thinking a lot about that and relating that to depression and the, you know, the crushing weight of depression and feeling so alone and feeling so hopeless. Um, and knowing that there are other people to help you through it. I, um, I lost my best friend to suicide earlier this year. Um, it's been significantly life-changing for me. And, uh, I had this moment of you know, I, I live by this mentality that I want people to not be depressed. I want people to not feel like there is no more hope left. And, you know, I kind of had this sense of failure and, um, and it's kind of ignited this stronger sense of like, we need to do more for other people around the world that are feeling this way. Um, and I think that finding a, a path where everyone feels included and everyone feels loved and they don't feel so hopeless and alone in these, um, these deep, dark moments of depression. And I, and I think that that is something that I'm trying to figure out um, how I can do better in the bigger picture. How, like, what can I, what I need to do more. And so that's something that's been really stirring in me lately. And um you know, I've got some plans coming up with, um, that ways that I can address that. And I've been involved in some, some programs that are helping change the world in that sense. And so I think that, um, helping people to not feel so alone is probably how I would summarize it. in you know, in a short sentence is, is the force that's within me. That's awesome. And I'm sorry for your loss. And thank you for sharing that. And again, while you were saying that, I went and looked up the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That's 800-273-8255. Again, seriously, please call. It can be better. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for for being a, a silliness. Thank you for... <laughs> for just being fun and, and having the courage to be you. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm really, I'm really glad to have done this cause I feel like I just made a friend and I, I really enjoyed getting to know you in this conversation. Um, uh, the couple of tragedies that have come out and, and hopefully some, some hope on the other side of that for other people. And I mean, seriously, thank you for sharing. This is, yeah. this has been wonderful. Thank you for, Thanks. yeah. Thank you for being a part of this. Thanks for having me. Yes. Oh my gosh. I don't even know how to close this now. So <clears throat> thank you so much, everybody for listening. If this episode was helpful, fun for you, you think somebody can uh, benefit from the stuff that we've talked about on this episode, please feel free to share it. Uh, also, please leave a comment. Let let me know what you think. You can find me at the Force Within You podcast on Instagram and Facebook. And remember, you all have the Force Within You, something exceptional that makes you stand out. You just have to have the courage to find it and let it out. Take care. <laughs>